well, participant is not going up. Uh, <laughs> so it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, Daniel Fisher for the second lecture on uh, high dimensional uh, ecology and evolution. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm trying a different setup today with my um, computer, so hopefully it won't um, cause uh, um, uh, cause problems, but let me know if there seems to be any, any difficulties and I can try to switch back to how I was doing it yesterday with some time delay. So um, yesterday we talked about uh, models in which only had one strain um, and when a mutant came up, if it, was, if it was doing better in that environment, then it would replace it. This would change the landscape by a small amount and that would change the future uh, evolution. And I'm sorry, I, I didn't actually give this um, the model a name. This model one could perhaps call the fitness snowscape, a landscape is something which is static, a seascape which people talk about is a dynamical environment. But here it's the evolution itself that changes the environment. So like when you're going up a mountain and you change the, uh, um, the environment that you're walking on as you, um, as you walk. And what I showed was that the simplest model and I should emphasize the particular model I wrote down with sort of the cubic interactions is the simplest model. And that exhibited the red queen phase where the evolution just continued without, uh, um, uh, without slowing down. And this, I, I said that it was very robust. And what I mean by that is if I change the model somewhat um, or do, do a different range of models, then we'll get the same behavior in the limit of infinite, uh, um, of infinite dimensions. I raised the possibility that there might be some other behaviors as well, but haven't, uh, um, um, uh, didn't talk about those. And then I left it open a question about diversification, which I know almost uh, um, uh, nothing about, but I think is the most interesting question for those, uh, um, uh, for those kinds of models. I should mention none of this is written, um, written up. I think someone asked me for the name of the model. So I guess this is the closest to being the, uh, um, uh, the name. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about um, uh, today and tomorrow is much closer to things people have been, um, several speakers have talked about so far, um, which is really talking about a situation where at least I've initially got a fixed environment, but I'm going to have multiple strains. And here I'm going to emphasize calling them strains rather than species, because I'm mostly going to be interested in one species with many strains within that, uh, um, uh, within that species. Okay. Um, and I'm going to talk initially about assembled communities where there's no evolution. So again, this is what several people have talked about, um, and introduce a random um, lot of Volterra models, which then we need to talk about the statistics. And they have a stable phase, as, as uh, uh, Stefano Alessina um, talked about, but then that can be unstable. I'm going to then talk about a special model, which is the perfectly anti-symmetric uh, um, interactions. Um, then more generally, that show that the, the chaos that occurs in that diverges. Um, and then how you, this can be stabilized by migration. And that's sort of going to be the main thing I'm going to get to. So I'm going to introduce the sort of phenomenology and the basic behaviors with some rough explanations. And then I'm going to go and talk about the, um, uh, the theory and using the dynamical mean field theory. And this is a theory, the, the method is also something which is applicable to what I talked about uh, um, yesterday, but there I didn't explain how I got in it. And then I'm going to turn to looking at slowly evolving um, uh, communities that I'll get to tomorrow. And also, I'm considering sort of phenotype uh, models, which would determine the, um, the interactions. Okay. So I should mention, so all, all of this work that I'm going to talk about today, at least all the completed parts, was done um, by Michael Pierce and Atish um, Agarwala, and is published in, in uh, PNAS um, this year, earlier this year. Okay, so the models that um, uh, we're going to talk about, the generalized um, uh, lotka Volterra models, and I'm going to call the number of strains K, so I labels those, runs from one to K, and NI is the population of strain I. Now I should apologize as this is different notation than um, Stefano used. He called the populations XI and called the number of strains N. Unfortunately, there's not completely standard um, um, notation. But I'm gonna start down writing the model as, uh, um, as he did. So one has the beta growth rates or growth and depth minus death rates here, RI, and then the interactions between the, um, um, between the strains. Okay. But we're going to be interested in the closely related strains. Okay. So if I have closely related strains, then it's natural to replace this by um, things which tell me what, how the strains are similar to each other. So I'm going to write that Ri then, say, is going to be equal to some R bar, which sort of average over, over all the strains, that's some common part, plus some varying part, um, plus some part which is varying, which I'm going to call Si. Okay, and I can think of the SI then as being like selective differences um, between them. 
And the natural one is then to take the SI with an average of, uh, um, of zero. So that's gonna be the variabilities, the way the strains differ from, um, uh, from each other. Okay. So that's gonna be my ARs. Now, what about the, um, um, uh, uh, the interactions? Okay, well, the interactions, I'm gonna consider two, um, uh, uh, two parts. So I'm gonna take the AIJ, is again gonna have some overall average, um, uh, average interaction, which will generally be negative if they're competing with, uh, um, um, with each other. That'll be less than zero. And then they'll have a strain specific one. And I'm gonna put a factor of N in here just so I don't have to carry factors around N anywhere else. And this is gonna be the interaction with, it, with itself. So Q is really gonna be the sort of niche, um, uh, niche interaction um, or one over the carrying capacity of that, uh, um, um, of that strain, okay? And then we're gonna put in some um, random parts. And again, I'm gonna pull out a factor of N out in, uh, in here. So the VIJs are the between strain interactions. And so the VIJ, again, I'm gonna take to have mean zero, and then I'm gonna say something about what the statistics of those, um, of those are, okay? So the, the VIJs are gonna mean zero, typical magnitude one sort of sets the overall scale. Now, since these are going to be um, considering um, different strains, this is gonna be, these are gonna be much larger than the differences. So this and this is gonna be small compared to these. And so what does that mean? That means that the R bar and the, and the A bar basically set the total population. They constrain the total population because they're the bits which are the, um, uh, the main um, interactions with the growth and the competition. So they're gonna constrain the total population and that I'm just calling this big N, which is the sum on I of the NI. Okay, and then I'm gonna consider what they essentially do is make this approximately constant and, um, and then there are variations, of course, between, um, with, between the NI, but with the N um, being roughly, um, roughly constant, okay? So in that case, then it's natural to define the frequencies. So I'm gonna define the frequencies, which are the fractions in the, um, uh, fractions in the population. So I'm gonna define new I as being equal to NI over the big N. So it's the fraction of the population. So obviously there's sum on I of the new I equals one. Okay, so that's going to be my um, uh, my model, and then I can rewrite the um, the model in the in the slightly different form. I'm combining these. I'm now going to pull out the R bar and the um, and the A bar, and I'm going to write the the model this way: is the D I N I D T, and I'm going to I'm also going to use the notation of a dot for that. So that's going to be new I. Okay, times. Well, now I've only got the differences coming in here. So I've got the S I, and then I've got the plus the sum on the J of the VIJ, oops, let me put them in other order. Um, it says the minus, the specific one, the Q times the new I, and then it's got the plus, the sum on the J, VIJ, new I, new J. Okay, but then I'm gonna put an extra piece here. Okay, where Upsilon is a Lagrange multiplier and the role of that is to make n equals constant, or more specifically, enforce this constraint that the sum on the new i is one, okay? So I'm replacing the effects of the um, overall growth interactions, and I'm only gonna consider the effects of the differences. So this is the differences in the growth and um, the decay rates. This is the interaction with it itself. And then this is the interaction between the, between the types. So this is the model which I want to uh, um, I want to understand, and this is going to have average zero. This is going to average zero. So of course, what we have to talk about is we have to talk about the statistics of the interactions. Uh, uh, Daniel. Yes. Daniel, so uh, do you really have uh, V I J no I no J there, or is just no J? So, uh, thank you. Thank you. I um, this is the drawback of writing things in real uh, um, is real time is one keeps the audience on their, uh, um, uh, on their toes. Um, so thank you for, for correcting that, yes. Um, so that's just a standard, uh, um, um, the standard interaction. And so the first term, this term here is, would be, you often written as like one over the, effectively like one over the carrying capacity, but I've, you know, rescaled things, uh, um, uh, real scaling things out. So I don't want to keep things um, um, all over the place. Oh, so I should say one other thing before talking about the statistics. I'm assuming no stochasticity at this point. Okay. But I will want to consider extinctions if nu i becomes less than one, 
i.e. ni, sorry, but um, less than one over n, which is corresponding to ni less than one, of course, then I can't have less than one individual that'll go extinct. So I'm gonna mostly consider the deterministic, the deterministic interaction, but then I'll talk about the effects of the extinctions, which of course can play an important um, um, role, um, particularly because they'll happen in even, even in the simple, um, um, the, the, the simple model. So this is my basic uh, um, model. And the thing which I then have to um, uh, say some things about is what the statistics are. I've said the interactions are going to be, interactions and the SIs are going to be random. Okay, so the SIs are going to be in, independent. Okay, and I can talk about the variance of those. Um, the variance of SI is just sigma S squared. Okay, and these I would expect that they'll be small very small because the strains are all similar. Okay, so this is sort of a consequence of the, uh, um, the prior evolution that they're all gonna be very similar to each other. If one was um, a better, that strain would diversify and so on. So this is gonna be a basic assumption that's small and to often I'm gonna set that equal to zero. Okay. But the crucial bits are the VIJ and what the statistics of those are. Okay, so again, I'm gonna take for, um, um, uh, for I not equal to J, so that's the interactions, I'm gonna take vij squared um, equal to one. So the variance of the v's is just equal to one. So this just sets the overall, um, uh, the overall scales of the time. Okay, but the crucial bit is then what are, what are the correlations? Okay, so in particular, I wanna ask what is the correlations between vij and vji? Okay, so this is gonna be the only correlation which I'm gonna put in. So this is gonna be the only correlation. It's going to be between those. So this is how the correlation between the effect of strain I on strain J and the effect of J on the, the on strain I. Okay. So if this is going to be competitive, then I would expect this to be positive. Okay. So I'm going to define a parameter gamma here, which is going to be that correlation. The competitive would correspond to gamma being um, uh, bigger than zero. If I'm correspond to gamma equals one is totally symmetric. That's correspond to a symmetric VIJ. And that's often what's, uh, um, uh, what's considered for models with competition. Okay. In general, gamma lies between um, uh, minus one and, uh, uh, and one. Okay. Sorry, then, then you, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. Shouldn't the VIJ also be small? So the variance of VIJ be over the one over uh, the number of species? Or well, uh, that's that's a, a, ch a choice of a, of a convention. That's a convention which often people choose for being useful. I want to talk about more things in terms of unrescaled uh, um, unrescaled quantities. So the interaction is setting the basic um, scale. There's nothing intrinsically that says it's going to be small. Okay. Now, since the new eyes, if there's many species here, the new eyes are going to be each of order one over K, then this interaction piece is going to be um, small coming from that with these random of order one. So this whole piece is going to be of order one over square root of k. But I explicitly don't want to scale out the uh, um, the k's. It's convenient for doing theoretical analysis, but I don't want to do it because it, it sort of confuses what one's assuming when one does that. Okay. Of course, I can have k, two, three, 20. I can add more things. I don't want to be rescaling the v's each time I add more things or take more things um, or take more things out. So these are I'm trying to keep it in terms of the the physical or the biological um, uh, the biological quantities. Okay, so gamma equals one would correspond to um, symmetric. What about um, gamma is uh, less than um, um, less than zero? What would that correspond to? Okay, so gamma less than zero. So this has um, uh, two possible things it can um, correspond to. One of them, for example, is if one, if I have a direct competition, so if one beats two, okay, what that means is that V one two is bigger than zero, but of course that means two loses to one. So two V two one is less than zero. Okay, so that's a natural way in which you can get anti-symmetric correlations in the, uh, um, um, uh, in the matrix. Okay, I just want to add an extra page in here um, um, before I have my next bit. Um, okay, so that, that's one, um, uh, one possibility. But there's another possibility and this I'm gonna talk much more about tomorrow and this is what uh, makes it much more, um, uh, much more interesting. There's another possibility which is I have bacteria um, so I have bacteria, and so those bacteria will have populations, say, B i, um, and they'll say B um, k of the bacteria, a number of those. And then I have phage um, with populations P um, uh, sub L, 
and I've got some number of, uh, um, of those. So I've got the bacteria and the phage, and these interact with, uh, um, uh, with each other. And so if I look at the dynamics of those, then bi dot would be bi, okay, times some growth rate for the uh, um, uh, bacteria. But then there'll be minus a term, which is coming from the interaction with the phages. So this would be some matrix here, um, H I L times the population of the phage. Okay, so that would be that term where these are going to be positive because they're, they're negative effects on the bacteria. And then I've got the phage, the, B, the PL is going to be, sorry, I also want to put a term in here, um, um, uh, put a term in here, um, which is a stabilizing term, um, some on uh, um, J of uh, um, NJ. So that's coming from the, um, uh, the competition, Ugh, EJ, okay. Okay. And then I've got the, the phage. So the phage, the, the phage are going to die at some, uh, um, at some rate. The phage are going to die at some rate, but then they gain by eating the um, uh, bacteria. So they have a someone I here of some other matrix. Um, um, and some other matrix F um, uh, now I, um, uh, L, I times the population of the bacteria. Okay, and again, these are going to be positive the way around I've got. Okay. So if I think of that as putting all these together, and I'm going to think of these as being strains of one species of bacteria and one species of phage, so I now have a two, um, uh, two species uh, model, but with diversity within the two of them. And if I look at what the interaction matrix is going to be there, so what is the interaction matrix going to be in that form? Okay, well, it's going to have this form here. If I think of putting the bacteria on top, and the phage underneath, it's going to have some minus constant all the way through um, uh, through this part from the bacteria interacting with each other. Then it's going to have minus the H from the bacteria interacting with the phage. Over here, it's going to have the F from the phage interacting with the bacteria, and there are no de de in specific interactions of the phage with these other. Okay. Now, what do I expect here? I expect that F will be approximately F bar plus something small, so delta F um, I um, L. And H will be some um, average um, average value plus some small variations. So again, in the same uh, um, um, spirit. Um, sorry, I've got my my indices backwards. Um, the um, um, so I, I have these here, and I would expect these will be correlated. So more specifically, F and H transpose are correlated. Okay, that's corresponding to the fact that, of course, if one phage does better against the bacteria, that bacteria is worse for the phage. Okay, so if I look at this whole matrix here, this whole matrix here, it has anti-symmetric correlations in the dominant parts here. There's also this part, which is, which is symmetric, but there's a dominant effect here, which is the anti-symmetric ones. Okay, now it turns out this model behaves very similar to the simple um, random Lotka Volterra model that I'm going to uh, mainly talk about. And I'll come back to this one um, some tomorrow. So you can think of this as being one of the primary mot motivations for considering models in which uh, um, gamma, can be, um, uh, gamma can be negative. Okay, so one thing we can then um, start to um, uh, talk about is what does this model look like? So I'm gonna focus on this model here. So we've got, um, here we've got two um, uh, main um, uh, parameters. We've got this parameter gamma here, um, 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 which we can make in red to find that. I've got that parameter is the key parameter. This um, upsilon is just the, uh, um, uh, is the Grange multiplier that adjusts itself. So the only other parameter we've got here is this Q which is this niche, uh, um, uh, niche interactions, and that's our basic parameters, okay? So we've got a model now with two um, parameters. One is the interaction within the, um, um, within the same strain, between the same strain, and one is the interaction with others, okay? And I generally have then the, um, the S's as well. So I have another parameter which is associated with the S's, but I'm gonna mostly consider the simple possibility where the SI's are zero. There's no overall differences. We can add back in the effects of those. So now I'm just going to show a phase diagram and I'm going to say how we, when, um, get, one gets it in a while. So the SSR is equal to zero. So we've got our two, um, uh, uh, two parameters here. We've got the Q, which is the self, uh, um, the self interactions. That's the strength of the niche interactions. And then we've got gamma, which is the, uh, um, the symmetry. 
Okay. Well, if the interactions are very strong relative to the um, uh, um, uh, it, within the strain, very strong relative to the interactions between the strains, then we've got the standard um, behavior and the limit of a large number of species. We've got a, uh, um, so this is now we're going to want to consider K, the number of species being much larger than one, the number of strains much larger than one. And up here then in this regime up here, we've got a single stable community. It's a large community, stable community. And that's actually um, um, with the high probability for the limit of large numbers of um, strains, there's gonna be a unique, um, uh, unique community there. Okay. So this is a result which has been worked out by, uh, um, uh, by, by many people, particularly a lot on, on recent um, years, but is more or less something which May already, uh, um, uh, Robert May already, already knew. Okay. But then there's a boundary, which is where that goes um, um, unstable. So there's a line I can draw across, uh, um, across here. Um, and this is a line here. And this line goes from zero to a value over here of Q of square root of two times K. And so here's where the square root of K that Matteo was asking about comes, uh, um, uh, comes in. So this is when Q is bigger than this, I have a single stable community. But when I lower the, uh, um, when I lower the Q and I cross through here, then, I, then the system goes unstable. I lose a single unstable community. Okay, and then the big question is what happens down here? Okay, what happens under there? There's not a single large stable community. That's the one thing we know. Okay. Now there's a special line. There's a special line which is corresponding to being along here. Okay, that's the line where it's the perfectly anti perfectly symmetric model. That's been studied by um, a lot of physicists also um, recently. And in that case, what's uh, um, unknown? So this is for gamma equals one. Um, for gamma equals one here, there are a very large number of stable um, communities. Um, there's actually exponentially many um, uh, um, different communities. Okay, but that's very special. And it turns out that as soon as you go away from gamma equals one, things change. This behavior over here has a lot of similarities as far as the dynamics to the things I talked about last time of the random landscape is you never actually get to one of these communities. You sort of wander around, things go bouncing down, things come back up again, and um, it never really settles into them. But if you just look in terms of the, the communities that exist, there are e exponentially many um, stable, uninvadable, um, uninvadable communities of, uh, of subsets. Okay. So it turns out this, um, this community up here um, is going to have in this case here, it's the number of the size of the community. So the number of which persists in the community um, is gonna be bigger, greater than or equal to K over two. So more than half the types uh, um, um, uh, persist. Okay. As you go down through here, let's say it goes unstable and we want to um, talk about down here. Okay. If we ask about putting a little bit of the S's in, um, so if the sigma of the S squared is not uh, um, uh, zero, um, if the sigma S, um, so the variance of the S's, as long as that's um, less than or of order, um, actually to that is the order one over root K, okay, then you only get qualitative, quantitative changes um, to the phase diagram. But it's, it's, it stays qualitatively the same. Okay, but I said we're mostly going to say the SI is equal to zero, and I can talk more about that. So one thing to note is that you need to have the selective differences being very small to get this behavior. If the selective differences start becoming substantial, then if we go back to our, our, uh, um, our basic uh, model here, that means this term will then tend to dominate and this term will be small compared to that because this is some of a whole bunch of random things. This will, do, this will dominate and I won't get the interesting, uh, um, um, the interesting behavior. Okay, now what about the Q? Well, here you notice that in order for the Q to be in big here, it has to be bigger than a value, which is the whole square root of K. Okay, so to get this, you need to get the stable community. To get that, you need to have K um, uh, greater than or equal to of order root K. Okay, so this corresponds to saying the interactions with your siblings Right? These are all different strengths. Interacting with siblings have to be much, much bigger than the interactions with all your second and third cousins. So this is basically equivalent to assuming that there are niches. You assume that each one interacts with its own strain um, much more than interacts with others. Okay, And there's no a priori reason to um, assume that. 
Okay. So the particular things that we're going to uh, um, uh, focus on here, the bit I'm going to want to focus on is actually along here, along this line there, where either the Q is very small, so we might as well set it to zero. The natural assumption then is if I have these closely related strains, so with the close relatives, the natural thing is to say that Q is very small. Um, uh, uh, Q equals zero. I've just got the random parts with that as well. If Q is of order one, that doesn't matter. Um, uh, that doesn't, doesn't matter much as long as it's small compared to um, uh, root K. Okay. So I'm going to consider that, and then for simplicity, I'm also going to consider the SI is equal to zero. Um, but I say that will come back and, um, uh, and re-examine. So I think uh, you want to get the questions as they arrive. There is a question in the chat, so. You can read yes. it, it says as, as anti-symmetry in A still doesn't capture the fact that the signs in the upper and lower triangles for the bacteria phase system are positive and negative. Doesn't okay. that make a difference in behavior? So the, the, um, the interactions by definition, the phages are bad for the um, uh, bacteria. Um, that's their lifestyle. So these terms here, this is had a negative sign and the H's are all positive. Okay. Over here, the phages are eating the, uh, um, um, the bacteria. And so this is the, those terms are also all positive. What, do, what the random parts is in the difference. So this is positive, this is positive, but then the random parts are associated with differences between them. Okay, so I'm gonna come back and talk more about this one, uh, um, um, this tomorrow. Okay, the other questions on the model or the sort of basic setup. And I say, I'm going to explain a bit of how one gets this um, phase diagram, but I mainly want to talk about this, uh, another, um, focus uh, this part here. There is another question. Uh, is there any variability ah. in the self-interaction or is ah. it always exactly? Ah, okay, sorry, I didn't see that one. So the self-interaction there, um, I can have, have some variability in it. I mean, in particular, if I look at my interaction here, I've got a part where I equals to J, so that would be the variability in it. It turns out if it's variable, variable by similar amount to how the interactions between strains vary, then it doesn't matter much in the limit of large K. It only matters in the limit of large K if it's big, in particular, if it has to be of order root K. It has to be much bigger. So I can turn the other way around and I can say, let's have fixed Q. That's going to be a property of you know, the biology, a fixed distribution of the S's and ask what happens if I add strains. So I'm assembling a community here. I'm adding more strains. And then what will happen is I add more strains. It'll go unstable. Okay, and where it goes unstable will be associated with how big the, uh, um, how big the Q is. Okay, so that's the that basic results of, uh, of May. He didn't really quite do things right, but the, um, the overall result is, is uh, um, um, he, he, he certainly got, got right. So that's this part of the phase diagram up here where there's a single large stable community. And what happens down here for large K really only started to be in, being investigated uh, um, um, in recent, uh, um, uh, recent years. And I'm gonna show some um, simulations of that, but then really try, try to develop the theory. Okay. So we're going to consider the behavior along uh, um, um, along here. Okay. okay, so we're going to consider the um, uh, the close relatives. Um, we're going to focus on this, and for reasons that the sort of motivation of the uh, um, bacteriophage, we're mostly going to concentrate on this region uh, um, um, uh, on this region here. So we're going to concentrate on gamma being less than uh, um, uh, less than zero, and it's between. Um, zero and minus one, but actually sort of believe that most of the behavior actually persists in this whole uh, um, whole region, except on that special um, special line. Okay. So I'm going to not, not talk about the stable community. I'll just say something about how one gets it, but I'm, I'm really want to talk about what goes on, um, uh, what goes on in here. Okay. So for doing something general, I want to do something very special. So one of the things that one has learned from you know, experience in statistical physics is there's a lot to be gained from having particular models that one can really under, uh, analyze and uh, understand in detail. And then one can sort of use ways of thinking about what's more general and what isn't to ask which features of those might persist and which ones don't. Okay, so I'm gonna first talk about a very special model and this has been looked at by um, over many years, um, a special model and that's the case where I'm going to have the Q equals zero, but I'm now going to have gamma equals minus one. Okay, so this is going to be the special thing. It's perfectly anti-symmetric. Right now I've got the anti-symmetric uh, um, uh, uh, V matrix. Okay, perfectly anti-symmetric. Okay, so this has a very special uh, um, uh, property. It has a um, various things which are known about it. It has a unique 
um, it always has a unique um, a stable community. And by stable here, I mean an un uninvadable. Um, community and this uh, um, uh, Stefano talked about in some generalizations of uh, of this and the size the size of this community is going to be um, approximately k over two um, plus or minus some um, uh, order square root of k which will depend on the particularization so this community is always says it's unique stable uninvadable community okay and in that community the each of the new eyes will be some fixed point uh, um, uh, value nu i star. So this is then the fixed point of the dynamics. Okay. Or nu i will be equal to zero for the extinct points, for ones that go extinct. Okay. So if you look at the surviving types, if you look at the surviving types, then it's very special. And you can see that this is very special because this fixed point here, this fixed point is marginally stable because of the anti symmetry. It means that all the eigenvalues for the stability around that fixed point are imaginary. So the imaginary eigenvalues, it's not stable or unstable. It's very special. Okay. And that very special behavior is associated with a conservation law, a conserved quantity. And so this is just a mathematical artifact, um, a conservation law, but which Stefano um, had uh, um, talked about. And this uh, um, um, this quantity here, which plays the role of a uh, um, of an energy, okay, it plays the role of an energy. I'm sorry, I'm going to I'm going to call it that, and it's just going to be minus someone i of the new i stars, okay, times the log of the uh, um, uh, new i. Okay. Now you can add another piece to this, which uh, um, uh, um, Stefano um, added. You don't have to include that for in this case because the total number is 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 one. So you've got this population here, and this is conserved. It's a Lyapunov function, but it's conserved on um, extinction law after the extinctions. So after all the ones have gone extinct. Before that, it's a Lyapunov function. It'll uh, um, uh, increase, and but when they go extinct, then it'll saturate and then become a conservation law. Okay, this is a conservation, law, and you notice this is the sum of a whole bunch of independent terms. Okay. The other thing to note is that in the log variables, so if I define li, which is the logarithm of the uh, of the new i, so this is just the log variables. They're the natural ones to think about. If I think about populations growing and uh, um, uh, growing and shrinking at some rate, depending on whether their growth rate, net growth rate, is positive or negative, so this is the the li's the natural variables. And in these variables, the phase space volume is conserved. Um, its volume is conserved. Okay, again, it's just a it's just a mathematical um, um, uh, uh, nicety, um, mathematical nicety, but it enables one to do certain things. Okay, so this means that there is a steady state, steady state of this, which is like equilibrium, um, like equilibrium stat mech of a bunch of interacting, um, of independent particles. Okay, so you can immediately write down the, the dynamics. There's a quantity which is like the temperature. There's a quantity here, which is like the temperature. Sorry, Daniel. Can I ask yes. a question? So, this, yes. so the uh, nu i in your equation for the e is a dynamical variable, right? right? The nu i is a dynamical variable, uh, right? So this is generally a function of time. Is uh, instead uh, is the fixed point. So, so but so the dynamics uh, does hover around a fixed point, or or does it go to a fixed point? Ah, okay. So the dynamics. If I look at the simple cases, okay. So I can look at the very simple, um, um, a, a very simple case here, and I can ask what this, uh, um, um, uh, what this looks like. And the the simplest situation I can got if if three of them survive, okay. Um, let's go down here. So if I have three surviving, okay, three of them in the community, in the stable community. Okay, the sum of those is always equal to one. So I can draw the flows here. Of, in the news, in a phase space where this would be pure one, this would be pure two, and this would be pure three, and somewhere in there there's a fixed point. Okay, so that's a fixed point, but it's marginally stable. And what that means is there's a family of um, a stable orbits. So there's that one there, or there's another one which is here. So these are all limit cycles. 
Okay, these are all limit cycles, a whole family of those. So there's a whole family of the uh, um, um, of the states, and that's where it's very uh, um, uh, very special. Okay, and in this simple community, they're just periodic like this, and this is in fact like the classic lotka volterra model of predator and prey, which has a family of uh, um, cycles here. So this is like, approximately like the original um, lotka volterra predator prey model with one of, uh, one of each. And its dynamics also looks like, uh, um, um, looks like this. And there's a whole family of uh, cycles. But we sort of know that that thing is very, uh, um, um, that thing is very special. Okay. So what happens more generally, so there's going to be something which is going to parameterize this, uh, um, um, this family, um, and there's something which is going to parameterize this family, which is roughly speaking how big a range they go over. Okay. So this is going to, this quantity E, it can be anything. It's going to depend on the initial conditions. Okay. So this quantity E here can be um, uh, anything. Um, well, it has, it's, it's constrained as to what values it can take, but it, the, the V is um, variable. And so just like in thermodynamics, this is going to classify the, uh, um, what state one is in. There's a whole family of states, right? So there's a family of states, a family of states here. And they're parameterized something which is like the temperature, which is, um, which is proportional to the average of the, um, of the energy over all of the, um, um, over all the species. Okay, so the quantities like the temperature, it'll determine how big these fluctuations, uh, um, the fluctuations are, and I'm going to show some pictures in a minute. Okay. This temperature is going to be conserved. I've got simple um, um, statistical mechanics. So if I look at the, the probability distribution of all of, the, uh, um, all of these, the probability distribution then is going to be um, um, the probability density of all the, uh, um, of all the new eyes. Okay, it's going to be proportional to new i to the minus one plus a quantity, which is going to be related actually to the new i star over um, theta. And that's because of the new i star appearing here. I exponentiate this, I get new i to a power. And then there's going to be a, a factor which is just going to be associated with a constraint, which is the delta function that all the sum on that j of the new j is equal to one. And of course, I need a product over all of the i here. So they're all independent of each other. They're independent of each other and this distribution, which looks like this. Okay. Rather amazingly, this is identical to the distribution from purely neutral theory. So this distribution is the same distribution you would get out if you just had a large number of species with a bit of migration in um, into them and they would have a distribution here um, which would be a distribution which would depend on migration rate in that case but it would have exactly the same distribution they would be independent so this looks like a neutral distribution okay but this is completely um, if you like coincidental this is just coincidence because the dynamics here is nothing like neutral there's no stochasticity it's driven deterministic um, dynamics Okay, so let me just, um, uh, there's a couple of questions um, uh, here. Um, so one of them is, is why is E of the sum of the terms with no in, uh, interaction? So that if you, I refer you to Stefano's, um, Alcina's um, um, uh, talks, where he showed explicitly that this is, this, this quantity is conserved. It does depend on the interactions in the sense that the new I star, right, these new I star um, are given by the Vs. So the Vijs determine those new I stars. So it does depend on the interactions, but the only way it depends on interactions is those. And this particular quantity is not interacting. Nevertheless, the species are interacting with each other. The strains are interacting with each other. And so there is dynamics and that's what we're going to be um, um, interested in. Okay. So this is all, all mathematical. This is just gonna motivate some things. If you don't pick up this, it doesn't matter for what, um, um, uh, for what comes later. Yeah, there's another question. Uh, uh whether it is a coincidence that the formula for E looks like an entropy. It looks like an entropy. It's not, it, there's a way of inferring it that it's, you think of it like an entropy, but it's not very useful, I don't find. It's more like an energy. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see, there's another, another one there. Um, yeah, so this, this is like, the, these are the neutral uh, um, cycles in the um, Volterra model. They occur when three in the community. 
But when you get more than three, when you get more than three here, so for k greater than three, well, okay, much, much greater than one at least, um, the, um, so for k much, much greater than one, what happens then is you might think that you would get a whole bunch of cycles, different cycles. Remember, everything is interacting with itself. Interaction between cycles tends to be unstable. It tends to drive chaos. And so here, one gets a chaotic state, um, um, a chaotic state, and there's a whole family of them, I say, parameterized by this quantity, um, uh, quantity theta. Okay. So now I'm just going to show this, uh, um, um, uh, what this looks like, and then we're going to try to um, explain it, because this only tells us a steady state. This doesn't tell us anything about the uh, um, uh, dynamics. Tells us about static snapshots. The static snapshots are not very useful because those static snapshots can easily uh, let us think that we're in a completely neutral model. Okay. However, these are large populations. These are micro populations. The ends are large. The demographic stochasticity effects is small. So the neutral theory just can't be right quantitatively. So this is a coincidence, but it's a real warning. The other thing you note here is that if theta is very large, when there's a lot of chaos, so theta is very, it's very large, then this is roughly uniformly spread out on a log scale. So it's roughly uniform on a log scale. Okay. So then, in fact, one sees in the, um, in the picture. So here's some um, numerics for this perfectly anti-symmetric uh, um, model. And here, the characteristic scale of the temperature, the temperature is basically how wide the fluctuations are on a log scale. So this scale is plotting on a linear scale. And you can see here on the linear scale, these come up, they spend most of the time down here and occasionally burst up. So these all have bursts uh, um, upwards. And I'm going to say why in a minute. They come up and come back uh, um, down again. Some other one comes up and so on. And you get this dynamics. To really see what goes on, you need it on the log scale. So this is the frequency on a log scale here. So this was this quantity, which I defined as being the Li, which was the log of the new i. So that's looking at that frequency. And each of these colors is then a different, um, a different type. And this is a function of time. Okay. So this is, this is the log you see the spread here. And this basically scale here, this scale here is, the, uh, um, is this quantity theta, which is like the temperature. If the temperature is small, they will be at a fixed point. So theta equals 0 corresponds to a fixed point, um, will, will correspond to a fixed point with no fluctuations. Okay, and large data will correspond to these well fluctuations. If you make data even bigger, you get even bigger fluctuations, but they're stable fluctuations, it's stable chaos. Now this picture is only after a lot of others have gone extinct. So if I started with others here, some of the other ones will go extinct and they go extinct quickly and stay extinct. Okay, so in addition to this, I've got um, approximately half of them are extinct, which I'm not showing. Okay. And this chaos you see by the time you get to uh, um, um, a relatively modest number of, uh, um, of types. And then you get this chaos behavior, and certainly in the limit of a large number. Okay. So what is this, um, uh, this coming from? What this dynamics is coming from this anti-symmetric nature of the V. Okay. And this dynamics one can call ecological kill the winner, and it's very related to things that um, Mercedes um, um, talked about um, today, which is that if you're, it's the disadvantage of being popular disadvantage of being in big numbers. Okay. So let's consider one particular strain here in, uh, um, here in black. Okay. Now at this point here, there's a whole bunch of blue strains, which are the large, uh, um, um, which are the large ones. And if it just happens that the signs of V is such that those blue ones favor the, um, the black ones, then they tend to drive the population of the black ones to come up. So these blue ones drive the population of the black ones to come up. So this then comes up. But then what happens when this comes up, then the strains which prey on it which, which, don't, which don't, don't like it, are the, the red ones here. So then those red ones will come up because this one is now high. So these red ones will now come up. These red ones will now come up. And what will those red ones do? They'll inhibit the effects of the, uh, um, um, of, of, of the black ones and the black ones will come back down again. Okay. Earlier on, when the blue one, then the black one first came up, the blue one started to go, um, to go, to go down. And again, this is because the anti-symmetric sign of the, um, and the anti-symmetric sign of the interactions. So this is a, a killer winner. It's something which is there clearly in bacteriophage models. It turns out you, you automatically get it when you've got these anti-symmetric models. Okay. And this behavior, this behavior for this purely anti-symmetric model is going to be a clue to behavior more generally. 
Okay, so the reason I'm going to talk about this is this kind of behavior with these fluctuations approximately uniform on the log scale, as you can see more here, spread out of some range on the log scale, that's going to be the ubiquitous behavior. The behavior is complicated. If you look in the details here, you see all these wiggles. Here you just see what looks like uh, um, um, what looks like bursts. Okay? And a crucial part of this is that each type, so each type here, um, um, each strain that survives, has a, a burst up to uh, um, uh, a bloom up to high numbers. Okay. So if you go, went on for a long enough time, you would see each of these um, strains coming up at some time. Some of them come up more often, some of them come up less, um, less often. Okay. So that's something which, which is sort of natural in the, maybe natural in the bacteriophage um, context. Okay. So this is kill the winner dynamics. Why is it called kill the winner? Well, whichever one is high at that time, oops, sorry. Um, whichever one is high at a given, uh, um, a given time, okay, the ones that do well against that, like this blue, red, black one here, those are the ones that will come up. And then because the anti-symmetric interactions, then they'll kill that one, that'll come back, uh, um, uh, come back down again. Okay, so that's where the, the, the kill the winner um, terms come from. This is used in several, uh, both um, ecological and, uh, e and evolutionary um, uh, context. And so maybe it was, um, is not the best term to use, but the basic dynamics here is coming from this anti-symmetric uh, uh, It pays for phages to attack or to evolve to attack the, uh, um, the most common um, uh, bacteria. They do best. And that drives it um, back down again. And it, it pays the bacteria to be resistant to the most common phages. Right? And so that's, that's the, op the opposite side of it. And that's what gives rise to this, uh, um, um, uh, to this dynamics. Okay. okay, but now we have a problem. The problem is, is this gamma is, uh, um, as soon as gamma is bigger than minus one, the behavior is different. The gamma equals one, very special. We have no conserved um, quantity, um, uh, uh, no conservation anymore. And what happens is we get a behavior like this, that if we look at the log, of the new, um, uh, the new eyes, and we look at them here, okay? Um, um, so that's the maximum they can go up to. So they'll be fluctuating around. So here's one of them fluctuating around, fluctuating around like that. Okay, bigger and bigger fluctuations. If I do another one, another one will fluctuate um, uh, around also, um, have even bigger and bigger fluctuations. And you get divergent fluctuations that go to extinction. Okay, so you get divergent fluctuations which drive extinctions. Now this one can very easily see already in with the three types. So if we looked when we just had three types, uh, um, uh, uh, three types here, you can already see this. So if we've got three types which are uh, um, uh, surviving um, um, there, and I look again at the uh, dynamics. So this is pure one, that's pure two, this is pure three. Okay, and in this case, we can have a fixed point in the middle, but that fixed point's unstable. That fixed point's unstable. And if I look at dynamics, the dynamics gets closer and closer to extinctions. So the dynamics goes around, gets closer and closer to extinctions. So this is unstable dynamics here, um, heteroclinic dynamics. Here it's unstable chaos. It's divergent chaos. There's no steady state. It just drives extinctions. The dynamics get slower and slower, bigger and bigger fluctuations, but as a mystic approximation breaks down. And of course, at some point here, I get uh, um, um, extinctions um, uh, if I go below, um, uh, below this. Okay, so if I go, um, go through there. So then what will happen is you end up with a few types left. They'll typically have a cycle with a few types um, um, in them. Okay. So this is behavior that tells us it was very special. It's pretty useless. So why do I care? So at this point, we have to ask, how does one uh, um, uh, stabilize the um, um, uh, stabilize the dynamics? Um, and um, um, let's see, maybe add some um, uh, add a page in in um, um, in here. So how can we now stabilize the um, uh, dynamics? Okay. So one way to stabilize this, it's a, a common thing to do. Okay, is by migration. Okay, so the normal thing one would think of is I've got some island that I'm um, uh, looking at, so that we're looking at, and then we've got some big mainland over here, and I have the species coming in from the uh, um, 
migrating in from the um, from the mainland, and so species I say comes in at, at rate uh, um, M I comes into uh, um, there, and this is the island I'm uh, um, I'm focused on. So we lose the uh, um, um, uh, uh, we we lose the possible extinctions here because I always get the extinction. So this is a big pool with all of the types, the strains in it. Okay, so what is that um, um, a cosmology? I'm just adding a little bit of migration um, term. However, this is cheating. I consider this completely cheating. It's cheating because the problem of diversity on the island is just replaced by understanding why there's so much diversity on the mainland. Okay, of course, if there's geographical structure and so on, that can happen. But we want to understand sort of which things happen in principle and in simple, um, simple models. Okay, so this is really cheating. So we don't want to do that. However, we can still think about migration. I'm now going to have many islands. So I'm now going to have I islands, um, uh, I islands, okay, where which are labeled by alpha is equal one up to uh, um, um, up to I. So those number of, of islands, okay. And I'm now going to have migration between uh, um, all of the islands and all the other islands. So I'm going to have migration going in both directions here. Um, migration going in all directions um, um, from each island to every other island, so on. Okay, so all to all migration. Okay, but things are going to be simple. Is the interactions are only going to be on the islands? So the interactions are only on the island. On the island. Okay, and all these islands are identical, so I'm not allowing my, myself to have different environments. Okay, now it turned out already two islands is uh, is interesting, but we're going to consider the case where this is going to be very uh, um, uh, uh, very large mostly. Um, they migrate from all to all of them, and so what does the dynamics look like? Well, if I look at the dynamics for a population on one island, so I've got now new i alpha, so that's the ice type on the alpha th um, island. So that's just gonna be new I um, alpha. Okay, so it's gonna have the terms that it's got, uh, um, it's got before. I'm gonna ignore the S and the, uh, um, um, the S and the Q here um, and just write down the, um, the, um, the interaction term. So this just has the sum on the, um, the J. Okay, and it's got the VIJ, which is the same on all of the islands, but then it's only the ones on the same island that it's interacting with. Okay, then it's got the um, uh, a Lagrange multiplier, which is just going to be for that island, which depends on time. That keeps the total population of that island fixed. Okay, but then it's got another part. It's got a part which is m, a migration rate here, and I'm going to normalize it this way. So it's sum on all the islands of the uh, um, uh, sum on all the other islands of the same species on the other islands. Okay, and then it's going to have a migration out. Um, uh, uh, new i alpha. Sorry, and this bit doesn't come. Um, um, this bit comes, of course, outside here. This is not a growth rate. This is migration in and migration out. Okay, so that's the that, that's the migration effects. They they come all to all, and this quantity um, uh, this quantity here. Okay, this quantity here. This is the average over all the other islands. And I'm going to call that quantity new i bar. Okay, so that's the average overall of the other islands. Of course, that can itself depend on time. So that's the island average. That's saying I get input from all of the other islands and I get migration out. Okay, so now we have to ask what happens. Okay, we have to ask what happens here. So we now model some number of um, uh, some number of islands. You can simulate the um, the different islands. They're all the same on each, and we can ask what goes on. So here's this, uh, um, 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 oh, sorry, I, I, this was meant to be um, uh, down here. Um, added the page in the wrong place. Um, so here is now, I'm looking at a situation with uh, um, uh, 10 islands. So we've got 10 islands here. Um, we um, see an example here where we've got global extinction. This is showing the one type, so one strain across many islands. So this is dynamics of one strain I'm looking at here. And the different colors are now the different islands. And you notice it's bouncing up and down on the different islands. 
it starts going down. If I look at the island average, so this is the quantity which is the island average, given coming from the total migration um, rate into each island. Sorry, I um, called the news N here. Um, I didn't have the um, normalization. And if that um, fluctuates around, if that fluctuates down, they don't get much migration anymore. And then if these die, die down, they just go extinct. So here's the extinction threshold when the frequency on an island reaches um, of that stream reaches one over n. So this is going to global extinctions. So I haven't made the assumption of the of the mainland. In this case, in this situation that I've got um, here, this particular one we've shown is if I look at the island average for this uh, type, this island average goes to zero at long times. Okay, so this is just going extinction. So I've got a global extinction. So that's boring. But you can also have the more interesting phenomena. Here's now looking at another strain in the same, uh, um, um, of the same population, the same community of the strains. So we're looking at another strain here. And this strain, you notice it comes up and down. You can get uh, local, um, uh, local extinctions. Here's something which has dropped all the way down to extinction um, down there. In fact, you can actually get the total population to go down small enough that it would, be, um, it would go extinct, but it actually doesn't because it happened to be some strains that are doing well at that time, they come up, they repopulate the other islands, and everything goes, um, goes along and stays. So this looks as if the, um, uh, um, the dynamics is stabilized. A crucial part here is that the chaos on different islands is desynchronized. Across the islands. Okay. Now it's generally true if you take two chaotic systems and you put a weak coupling between them. So we're particularly going to be interested in the cases where the migration is very small. Um, we're going to be in, interested in the small migration. Sorry, messed up the pages. So we're interested in M being very small, um, um, less than basic, uh, um, uh, uh, basic uh, growth rates um, times. So when, when M is very small, we get this uh, um, uh, desynchronization. It doesn't have to be that small to get, uh, um, to get that. And we can get this behavior. Now, not only that, but you can actually have a new type. So here's a new type. It's initially coming in on one, uh, um, uh, one island. It comes in there, rises up, rises up enough that it starts seeding other islands. It actually comes back down again. It goes extinct on its island, but meanwhile it's seeded some other islands, it rises there, some of those go extinct, but eventually you get to something which is a steady state that looks like this. Okay. So what we've got here is when one finds from the, the simulations at least, that we have a possibility for stable chaos here. We can get stable chaos by desynchronizing all the islands and we can provide a um, pool. Okay. So our theoretical challenge is to try to understand this, um, um, this behavior. Okay, so that's going to that, that's going to be our challenge. That's going to be what we want to try to uh, um, uh, try to do. Okay, now I should um, uh, uh, be honest here. Um, being an old-fashioned theorist, um, I tend to think that um, the one of the roles of theory is to confirm simulations rather than the other way around. If I give you a calculation in detail, you can check whether it's right. If I give you a simulation, it's much harder to check whether it's right. Okay, and in fact, in this case, the theory actually came before the. Uh, um, um, before the simulations, and then there was a very nice back and forth between the theory and the simulations of some of the things that I'll talk about uh, um, um, talk about tomorrow. Okay, so we really want to try to develop theory for understanding this. We want to understand the simplest situation, which is the chaos on the on the one island um, in the perfectly anti-symmetric case. So we wanted to um, understand this, and then we want to build on that to understand the dynamics of the um, of the models with the uh, um, um, on the many islands. And I should be able to move. Well, never mind. Um, 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 yes. So we want. So we want to be able to understand uh, um, understand all this. Okay. So this is the basic uh, um, uh, the basic phenomenology. If I look at any given species, it can spend a lot of time down here, down at the sort of floor that's set by the migration. The migration in, as long as it's coming in here. This is the, the migration I'm coming in at the sort of black rate, which will set the sort of floor here. And so this floor coming from the uh, um, uh, migration, they won't tend to drop below that. Okay, so this thing, this um, um, uh, dashed line, um, we can sort of call the migration floor. Um, uh, floor, that's the lowest it's gonna go between, but, but, but between uh, um, um, on an island. Okay, but where this floor is, where this floor is, is set by this new I bar, which itself can be a function of time. 
Okay, so are the, are the questions on the, the, the basic uh, model, the basic um, phenomenology? Okay, so a question here, how much does the floor fluctuate based on how many islands are? Ah, okay. So this is a, a, very, good, uh, um, a very good question. One of the things we're clearly gonna want to understand is this fluctuations of the floor with a large, but you know, finite number of islands, 10 is not that big. And of course, if this goes down far enough, then we can get extinctions as we did here. Here, the total population across all the islands, which was the sum of all these, um, that went down low enough that I had extinctions. So one of the things we would like to ask about is about when do we have global extinctions um, and the when do those global extinctions, um, how do they depend on the number of islands and other, other things. So that's one of the things we, we need to um, um, understand. And that's one of the things I say, which the understanding of came, came later and uh, um, the um, uh, really with the sort of back and forth of the theory and the um, simulations. Okay, so now I'm going to um, talk about the, um, um, the theory and let's see how much time um, left, maybe 10 minutes before. Um, um, well, no, I should, probably, I should probably stop now and take, uh, um, yes. um, uh, take questions. Um, let me just write down um, uh, uh, one thing, which is just sort of to lead as to where we're, um, um, uh, where we're gonna go. So this is now a um, general method, which is dynamical mean field theory. It was developed in the, um, a lot in the context of, uh, of spin glasses. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on one eye on one island, okay? And the dynamics of this is gonna be coming from something that looks like noise from the others. Okay? But this noise from the others is gonna be determined by the dynamics of all the others. So this is coming from all the others. So I need to understand this because of course this comes from all of the others, um, um, all the others, all the other types on that um, island and the new eyes on all of the other uh, um, um, islands. So this is again affected by um, migration. This is gonna affect it via the, uh, um, uh, via the interactions. So it's coming from all these. And so determining what this noise is is a big challenge and one has to do that self-consistently. So this noise then has to be determined um, self-consistently. Consistently. Okay. So this strategy is exactly like mean field theory for a, uh, um, uh, for a magnet. It's exactly in the same spirit as that. There one assumes that one spin, one makes the approximation that one spin here has an effect of a field coming from all the others magnetic field coming from all the others. That magnetic field depends on the magnetizations of all the others. The magnetization will always give you this field that gives this magnetization. You don't have to average this um, to give dynamic to this spin. We have to average that to get the magnetization. So it's exactly the same spirit as doing mean field theory for a, uh, um, um, uh, uh, for a magnet. And it's gonna be valid in the limit that K is very large. So K is um, uh, going to infinity. And when we do the things with the islands, we're also going to initially want to take i to infinity. And then, of course, we have to ask the crucial thing is what happens if those aren't infinite. Okay, so this will be the spirit. And I'll, I'll start next time with explaining really in detail how one um, does this and trying to explain the results that we've got. And then I'll follow that with things on more open questions and talking about evolution and things. Okay, thank you very much. So um, other questions? Hey, Daniel, um, I have yes. a small technical question. Um, so does, this may be silly, but does the fixed point correspond to the dynamical mean at all? Is that what's going on? Oh, okay. So when, I, when I'm in the anti-symmetric model, okay, so the anti-symmetric model where there's a fixed point, okay? So here in this anti-symmetric model, this has the, um, the, a fixed point associated with it. Um, and that as Stefano um, uh, worked out, um, theta equals zero is the fixed point. Here, when I've got positive theta, in general, the average of the new i, and this is averaged over time, the time average of that will be equal to the fixed point value. Okay, That's yeah. true here. When I have migration, it's not going to be true. And when I've got migration, it's not going to be, um, uh, not going to be true because I can't straightforwardly average things. 
So where that came from was dividing this by this and averaging the Li's, the logs. And if you average the logs, this averages out and you get the fixed point condition. But you notice here, if I average the logs, then I have to pull out a one over new i down here and it becomes nonlinear, becomes extra nonlinear. So this is not true with the migration. Okay, so that statement is only true with no, uh, um, um, uh, without um, uh, a migration. As soon as I've got my break migration, then there doesn't correspond to that. And in fact, if I look at the dynamics here, when I'm um, looking at all these things, there's no fixed point, there's no stable fixed point in this case. Okay, there is a possible behavior of all the islands being in sync. If all the islands are in sync, then it's exactly like one island. But then it'll just fluctuate wildly and drive the uh, um, uh, drive the extinctions like this. Okay, but the chaos will tend to go a little bit. The differences will tend to make the chaos go non asynchronous between the uh, um, um, uh, between the islands and this crucial bit of this chaos um, um, uh, uh, desynchronizing, which is what causes uh, um, and this enables it to persist. Okay? So it's no longer true here that there is a fixed point, even a stable fixed point. Um, and the um, and each island is doing sort of its own thing, but they're coupled to um, each other via the um, via the migration. So we we have another question from uh, Miguel and then uh, Mercedes. Miguel Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah th thank you, Daniel. That that was that was really cool. Uh, I I have a question that doesn't really affect much of the math of the, uh, the development of this model, uh, okay. but it's mostly on the biological assumptions of, of the uh, phase ah, okay. interaction. Okay. So in, in, this, in this matrix that you use, uh, you, you say that by, by definition, uh, the interaction between phage and bacteria is uh, basically an interaction of parasitism. Right. Uh, but we know right. that, we know that the, if we consider the prophage phase of the, of the viruses, actually many viruses have a mutualistic interaction with the bacteria and more recent work by Jed Furman, for example, shows that in the wild, this is the norm, not the exception. Uh, how, how will that affect this, uh, this, uh, the, the stability of the, okay. of the um, okay, so as in everything with biology, there are all kinds of complications and I'm not claiming it all here to understand specific biological systems, okay? However, I would make the following statement. If all phages were prophages that had symbiotic interactions and they were not, they were not parasitic, they didn't attack, okay? I personally think there would be a hell of a lot less um, uh, bacterial diversity or phage diversity. Those are bit, they're, they're behaving differently, then you can get you know, stability and so on. And that stability can be there, but it will pay for some of the phages to adopt a different, uh, um, a different lifestyle. And then those are the ones that will drive this kind of dynamics or can and will drive, I think, the, the longer term evolution. Okay. So I, I mean, I, my, and this is, I say, this is just an instinct at this stage, but it's sort of based on developing understanding, is that really the absolutely crucial thing for, um, for diversity and for longer term evolution is really these sort of antagonistic, um, um, and antagonistic interactions. Okay. One certainly can get a lot of diversity and complications coming from interactions via resources and so on. I think one has to cook things up much more to, uh, um, to do that. And what I'm trying to convince you here is that something can happen with very little assumptions, right? So I made very specifically, I'm making assumptions here that I don't have the niche interactions. Okay. I don't have niche uh, um, interactions. I'm not assuming anything special to interaction with itself. Now, the analogous thing for the niche, for the phage, would be to have specialist phages. Each phage is attached to one bacteria, okay? And then those will, those will interact um, um, with each other. Then they'll tend to have cycles or can have cycles or can be stable. Again, there can be pressures for the phage to start doing something, um, um, uh, uh, something different. But there you're assuming, in some sense, the answer. You're assuming that everything has, its, has a niche. And if I have a slight variant of the bacteria or a slight variant of the phage, that will no longer be exactly in that niche. And then you can get back into these kinds of um, situations. So I think that's a really important question. I hope that'll be something which will come up in the roundtable discussion um, next, uh, um, um, next week. But I should be clear, I'm really trying to ask about what possible, which things, you know, not surprising. If we can get things in really simple models, then we can say, geez, maybe they're not so surprising that we see them in, uh, um, in nature. But that doesn't mean that we can apply it to particular, um, you know, particular biological systems. And there are always very large numbers of extra complications. 
The same is true in physics, I should say. You know, I'm a condensed matter physicist, not an atomic or a particle physicist. So I've always dealt with, uh, um, dealt with complications. And one has made tremendous progress by saying, okay, we're going to try to ignore all of the complications, look at simple models, and then we can sort of add the complications in one by one. And I think that really would, would be the goal, um, the goal here. In particular, I can ask, okay, maybe the way the evolution goes is that I drive things which go in the direction of they get more niche-like. That's a possibility. The other one is this assumption here, um, which is that I've said, I'm going to assume these are very small. I could say what's going to happen is it's going to be generalists that evolve. What does a generalist correspond to? A generalist corresponds to its uh, um, S getting larger, right? It's doing well against all of the others. So the S is evolving would correspond to generalists. And I'm going to say something briefly tomorrow about that, uh, um, uh, that possibility, what happens in evolution. Okay. So the crucial thing here is we really shouldn't be talking about assembled models. We have to ask, can this evolve? Right? Of course, if it evolves elsewhere in the world, it can come together assembled and that can be relevant, but then it will continue to evolve. Bacteria and phages evolve fast, especially when they're in new conditions, like being with you know, new 23rd cousins um, instead of being with their close, uh, um, uh, close relatives. So the crucial thing here really is to ask whether you can get to these kinds of things from evolution with, again, reasonably simple assumptions about the evolutionary process. So that's what I'm going to sort of end with, um, 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 end with tomorrow. So we have Mercedes and uh, Chris Mercedes. Yes, quickly. I, I just, yeah, you just said that uh, the important uh, question about can you assemble it with evolution? So, so it was a bit my comment. But in reality, I think a lot of uh, it will be very enlightening to connect these kinds of uh, analysis to evolution on trade space because the where you connect the vijs yes to yes to, of the vijs well, yes. it's not just evolving particular parameters is that the result yep. of that evolution gives structure to yes. the vij yes uh, so my, my <laughs> last thing my last topic here um tomorrow is to talk about uh, phenotype models so that's exactly going to be evolution in trade space and I have some preliminary things to say about that. So what this would be, this would be where the VIJs, of course, are determined by the traits of strain I and strain J. And if I, I is a phage and J is a bacteria, those are really the traits associated with interaction. So I'm going to say a little bit about that at the end. So that's absolutely crucial. I think I it is crucial, and I think it is the, the challenge, because I think, I think like it will also enable the empirical problem, which is if we look at some distributions, when you say this could look like neutrality, right? right? In reality, we have to ask what are these microscopic properties that, that right. differentiate from neutrality right. and that tell us something insightful right. about right. the processes. So I'm going to say something, I say very brief and very preliminary, very conjectural still about the simple phenotype models in the context of the bacteriophage um, of age system and how that connects or might connect to what I'm talking about. Okay. So I'm going to say that the things which I've just shown here today, those are all solid. There, this, there's one paper on um, those with a um, quite long paper um, and the, the methods I'll talk about tomorrow. After that, everything is very conjectural, very much work in, uh, um, in process and particularly the continual work of Michael uh, um, um, with, uh, uh, with Michael Pierce. And really, these are exactly the questions that I want to come to. So thank you for uh, um, advertising my, uh, um, <laughs> my talk tomorrow, which I guess is the last of six talks tomorrow or something, or, or is that today? It's the, um, so thank you for, um, for being here, those of you that have survived um, some of the, the earlier ones. Yeah. So we have uh, one uh, question in the chat from yes. Uh, do you have an idea of how experimentally test uh, cows? Yes. Okay. So one of the crucial things from, um, from here is that snapshots of abundance distributions can be very misleading. And I showed that just with this simple, you know, idealized anti-symmetric model, you got snapshots that look very close to uh, a neutral, neutral model. You put in numbers and it just doesn't make sense for microbes. And that's also true with this state, which, is, which I've been talking about, where I've got many islands and so on. Again, if you take snapshots on one island, you will see things that look neutral. So the crucial thing is to look at the dynamics. The crucial thing is to look at them, you have to follow the dynamics of the strains with time. Now, this has been done, particularly in planktonic um, systems. Um, uh, Forrest Rohr and, and others have done that and looked at that. And you tend to see chaotic dynamics of things coming up and down. 
Okay, you know that that's a more complicated system, but the planktonic systems are just the kind of ones I want to think of in this in this context. They're much simpler than things like you know human guts, um, and they um, things mixed together. They compete. The spatial structure things can uh, move move uh, um, uh, move around. But really, the secrets are in the in the dynamics. Now, in the long run, they're in the evolutionary dynamics as well as the ecological dynamics. And so, you want to understand the sort of relations between the strains and so on. And you'd really like to be able to track the genes that were responsible for the traits that dominated the interactions. So coming back to Mercedes' um, point. So you would really like to be identify those and track those genes so that even if those genes were not always in the same organism, they were moving around, you could track the dynamics of those genes. Okay, that were associated say with the phage receptor and the, um, and the tail of the phage that binds to, to that. The simple example. So really, one would like to be able to identify those and track those, and then you can use all genetic uh, um, tricks to be able to uh, um, uh, to be able to track those. Okay, so that's really you know thinking about the sort of future and how one might hope to make concept contact with reality, but contact on sort of the conceptual um, uh, ideas. And this is you know this is sort of a scenario for getting uh, um, um, uh, diversity and stabilizing and evolving diversity. It's it's not something which is uh, think of a predictive theory in any any detail. Um, a detailed sense, but it really a scenario and it suggests what things to uh, um, to look at. So let's take one last question from uh, Armoni. Daniel, um, so I've seen um, a lot of work gone into using second quantization um, yeah. with, I mean, using, I say like, um, what's only been done in, in spatial settings in geography. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was wondering, especially in this context of DMFT, um, if there's any real advantage or if it's just something purely aesthetic, because you say that, yeah. you say that, uh, for example, well, from what I understand of DMFT, it's, I mean, you need small fluctuations around the average, but then again, I think would having a second quantized form. Yeah, yeah. Allow so you can like write things world. you can write things as a field theory you can start yeah. with the writing a field theory for the dynamics and that's a useful way to sort of drive things okay but i want to make a comment about this because you know people coming from physics as i do one tends to like to put things into a form that one can then beat on and use the standard tools okay some of those here in this particular context one can do and these ideas that came from spin glasses and so on okay the um um, the, and some of that you can say do with field theoretic, it turns out doesn't help much. You can just you sort of check that you're doing things in a consistent, consistent way. There's another and much simpler problem, which I've worked on a lot, which is trying to understand dynamically continually generated diversity coming from evolution in large populations. And this is a large bacterial populations in the lab or viruses within a person, within a host, and they just evolve, they're racing the whole time against, uh, um, against other than this continual evolution. Okay, for that you can quickly write down asexual evolution looks like a field theory. I have never seen anybody get anything useful from the fact that it looks like a field theory. Okay. The things that I find I bring from statistical mechanics are some of the conceptual things and some of the ways of sort of thinking about asymptotics of how to approach uh, um, problems and how to ask about questions of robustness to convince oneself or try at least that what one is doing is not very, very special. Okay, so the, a lot of the things you can't do by sort of cranking out the uh, um, uh, methods that one has from um, uh, statistical physics or from field theory, which makes it very, you know, makes it a lot of fun, makes it hard. You can't just assign a problem saying, okay, here, go do this and uh, have a means of doing it. This is still very much, um, and the things I'm going to talk about here, to some extent, is still very much an art. Um, and it's not sort of methods that you can directly take to be able to do it. You can write down things like this dynamical mean field theory, but you just can't get anywhere with it um, um, without a sort of lot of extra um, um, uh, you know, conceptual ideas and uh, um, you know, mathematical, um, uh, to some extent, trickery when one's only used it once, but one hopes that becomes a, becomes a method. Okay, thank so thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we can stop here and uh...